Welcome back, ladies, to our spring Bible study, This Present Kingdom. We are so excited to be back together with you this week after taking a week off for spring break. So welcome. <clears throat> yes, welcome. We hope you enjoyed some much needed rest and relaxation over the last week. And while you are tuning in with us this morning, why don't you go ahead and share this feed on your own social media pages and leave us a comment below on how you spent your spring break. Yes, and no matter when you're watching, you can still share it on your own feeds because you never know when your girlfriends will tune in. That's right. And while you're there, you can go ahead and follow us on Instagram and Facebook and um, just get plugged in with us on social media because you'll notice that we do post like last week. Yeah. Since we weren't here on campus, we did a post each day of the afterward. I love that. Yes, which is our podcast that we started this semester. And ladies, it is, it really is rich. If you have not been tuning into that each week, you're definitely going to want to. You definitely yes. do. And many of you, like we said, are joining in all throughout the week. Um, and we're so excited to have you joining in with us for this study. If you haven't yet, go ahead to bellevue.org slash women to register for the study. And when you do that, you'll receive an email that will give you the lecture notes for today's session, as well as what we've covered all through the semester thus far. And then you'll also get some emails from Paige throughout the week with additional information. Yes, please do, because like I said, it is never too late to register. Never too late. So go ahead and do that at bellevue.org slash women. And just... <laughs> Tune in with us each week. Welcome back here. And welcome back to our ladies in the fellowship hall. Good morning, Hi, ladies. ladies. Hi, friends. <laughs> You're all getting settled in. We're so excited to have y'all back this week. And those of you watching with us in your small group rooms. Hi. Hello. We're so excited to be back together with you this week. So today we will hear from Jean as she teaches from Matthew 6, verses 1 through 8. So go ahead and get your Bibles out and turn there as we prepare for today's lesson. You know, Paige, I have to say, it was really nice to be back in our normal Tuesday routine. I know, kind of getting back in the rhythm this morning is so nice. Yes. I don't know if all of you realize how much we absolutely love spending our Tuesday mornings with y'all yes. and how much we miss you even when we just have one week off. It's a it highlight. is so nice to be back together. And But it, I mean, it is nice getting to spend time with our families last week. Yeah, so speaking of that time, Paige, we asked the ladies what they did for their spring break. How about you? Why don't you tell us how you spent your exciting spring yes. break? Well, I may have done something exciting. We went to Disney World for the first time last week. I know. Oh, so this is guys. our first big family vacation. We took my two and three-year-old with us. It was just the four of us. It was so much fun. I'm getting to go. I'm not going to lie. Of course, it was Disney social distancing style. So, you know, we had the masks on every day and just getting a two-year-old to keep on his mask each day was a challenge, but he did it. Look, he's adorable. Look at and him. And so we had an absolute blast, but Caleb and I um, kind of had a laugh on the way home. So after a trip, we like to ask each other, you know, what was your favorite part? What did you love? Yeah. You know, what was your favorite ride at Disney? Yeah. And we were giggling because to be honest, John's favorite ride was the Skyliner going back and forth to the parks, you know, ride. And Steven's favorite ride was... Is that, laid back. Yes. Look at him. And uh, Steven's favorite ride was the elevator at the <laughs> resort. <laughs> yes. He going up and down floors, pushing buttons, it made his life. Oh, and man. so, but it, if we're being fair, I think everyone realizes we went to Disney for mommy, yes. not the kids, <laughs> because they're not going to remember. But we had such a blast. Well, you can show them the pictures. It's all we the did. Memories. And you know, when I'm just feeling, you know, like spoiling the kiddos, I'll go take Steven to an elevator one week and oh, we'll just it'll make, just their make day. his day. I know, but what about y'all? Oh, in? that's so fun, Paige. Well, we spent a few days uh, at a cabin in Gatlinburg with my parents Aww. and we had so much fun. We went to the aquarium there and Theo loved the little Look. fishies, jellyfish, he loved all that. Uh, we also saw a dinner show, did some shopping, ate lots of good food. He was so excited about this yes. show. Yes. Look at him. Oh, y'all are so cute. That I will say, so sweet. you know, going on vacation with a baby or, you know, little ones, it's much less relaxing than it used yeah. to be. <laughs> We're at a whole new stage of life now. Yeah. Traveling is so different. But right, it's so much so fun sweet. to see them, like, experience things for the first time and how much, like, wonder they have for yes. everything. So I love yes. that. Yeah. And y'all, I mean, we probably should focus back on what we're here for, Yeah, but sorry. it has been such a sweet time away last week, but we are so excited to be back together with you. And like I said, if you want to go ahead and share this feed on your social media pages so your girlfriends can join in with us, um, we are just so excited to have you back. And those of you here on campus and even those of you at home, let's go ahead and stand up as we get ready for worship this morning and just sing praises to our Lord. are 
are the church. We are the bride of Jesus Christ. And this morning, uh, I want to sing a song with you uh, where we ask God to come and to meet us and uh, to build his kingdom here in our hearts and in this place. And so this morning, we're going to sing, Build Your Kingdom Here. Join, it, join with me as we sing. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church and we need your power in us. That is our prayer. Would you build your kingdom here? Yes. Holy Spirit, invade the atmosphere of this place today with your presence. Sit down beside us, your daughters. Oh, Father, speak to us. Lord, I pray that our minds would be receptive, that our hearts would be soft. 
and pliable and that our will would be to obey your every word. Oh God, how we do pray for your healing presence to minister to each one of us, whether it's physical, spiritual, or emotional healing. Father, there is not a one of us in this room, in this building, or online, who does not need a fresh touch from you today. So God, meet us here. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome to Bellevue Women. Thank you so much for joining us for week six in our study, This Present Kingdom, the disruptive message of the Sermon on the Mount. Today, we're looking at kingdom righteousness. You know, up to this point in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has been exposing the state of the heart of the believer. First, in the Beatitudes, he gives us a description of the ideal character of the believer. And then, after two convicting metaphors, you remember those, salt and light, we're given six illustrations of surpassing righteousness and what that means in the life of a believer. And now in our passage this week, he goes even deeper into the motives and intentions of our hearts. As we saw this week, in the culture Jesus lived, public displays of piety were very common, especially among the Jewish teachers of the law and the Pharisees. They would make a great show of performing all of their religious duties. When they prayed, it was with excessive showmanship. When they gave, it was for all to see. Everything they did was to gain the admiration and approval of others. They took their spiritual pulse from the way others viewed them. They lived their lives for the wrong audience. The audience of the many. This emphasis on the external performance was offensive to Jesus. And so right here in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, he flips the script. Jesus addresses self-righteous behavior that seeks to be noticed by others and he makes it clear that his followers are to live for a different audience, the audience of one. We exist for one thing and one thing only, ladies, to bring glory to God. Think with me about some of the people that Jesus celebrated. The Good Samaritan, the widow who gave her two mites, the four friends who brought their paralytic friend to Jesus, a woman who broke open the alabaster jar of perfume, None of them had large social media followings. None of their names ever showed up on a who's who list. In fact, we don't even know their names. But what we do know about them is that they refuse to live for the audience of the many. They live their lives solely for the audience of one. And as a result, Jesus celebrated them. The question we must answer is what audience are we living for? The many or the one? When we live to impress others, our earthly reward is limited and fleeting. But when our only motivation is to bring God glory, we will receive the greatest reward of all, God himself. As we sing this next song, would you make it the declaration of your heart? In Christ 
alone our hope is found. He is our light, our strength, our song. And as you sing this morning, sing for an audience of one. wrought on our behalf you redeemed one like me 
feet from the miry pit of sin. You drew me out by the Spirit of the living God and set my feet upon the solid rock. And you have put a new song in my heart. And today we proclaim as daughters of the King, you and you alone are worthy, 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 worthy is the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. Oh, Father, Father. Turn our hearts to you this morning. May we look at you full in the face as we look into your word. We ask that you speak. Lord Jesus, these women are here and I trust nothing of myself. Father, my hope, my confidence, it rests in you today. But I'm asking, Lord, when I open my mouth, you will speak. For these women, as well as my own heart, we need to hear from you today. Lord, cause us to be desperate. Cause us to be wrecked by your grace. Cause us to look long into the face of our blessed Savior and learn to live a life that glorifies the Father that others might see Jesus in us. That is our plan. We bless you and praise you today. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Would you be seated? Oh, my goodness, y'all. That is one of my most favorite songs. Thank you, thank you, thank you for bringing us to the very throne of God today. Oh, it's so good to see you. Uh, When I have an extra week, as I have just had, I've just got to tell you, my lesson just gets longer and longer, and I just get fuller and fuller. And there was a day this week, I thought, I'm going to have to call them all up and just tell them what I've been seeing in the scripture this week. I tell you, God is on the move, and he wants to speak to our hearts today. So would you be opening your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 6. And I want to welcome those of you who are watching this online. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in today. We've already prayed that the technology would work well and that the Spirit of God and the Word of God would somehow flow from our hearts to yours and that God himself would connect us through the power of his Spirit. So God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. Look with us, if you would, in Matthew chapter 6. And we're just going to be looking at eight verses. So out of the gate, I'm just going to read them all to you. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Beware, Jesus says, of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by then. And I'm just going to give you a spoiler alert. This is the key to understanding this text. Otherwise, he says, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give, and may I just remind you, it does not say if you give. It says when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the street. So they may be honored by men. So they may be seen of men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, to the poor, you my followers, when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving will be in secret. Now get this, and your father who sees what is done in secret, he will reward you. Verse 5, when you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, pray to your Father who is in secret. Forgive me for touching the microphone. Pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, again, not if you pray, but when you pray, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. As Dana said in our introduction in this section of Scripture, Jesus is moving us just a little bit deeper. He's already been teaching how the believer is to live, and now He's going to take us a bit deeper to show us that not only 
only is he interested in a heart change which comes at the moment of our conversion, but he is interested in the motives that are behind our actions in spiritual disciplines like giving to the poor, prayer, and Donna will cover more about prayer next week and fasting as well. Today in our study, we'll just be looking at the first two which are giving to the poor and prayer. Beloved, he starts out giving us this warning. Beware, be careful, here's a caution. I want to remind you this, that you are not to practice, this is in verse 6, excuse me, chapter 6, verse 1. You're not to practice your righteousness before men to be noticed of them. Now, beloved, he doesn't say you're not to do good works in public. He just told us in chapter 5, verse 16, let your light shine in such a way that men will see your good works and they will glorify your Father who is in heaven. This is not an admonition not to be about the Father's business in public. The admonition is be careful of your motive lest you practice your righteousness before men. And he goes on to say those who do, well, they get their reward. So the first thing that I want to show you is what I call the sacred practice of giving. I'm going to be talking very fast, so hang on. I have a whole lot of words that I can already tell even for me they are coming out at an alarming rate. Someone next week should remind me not to drink so much coffee before I come into this place. So, uh, to tell you the truth, I'm a bit wrapped up on caffeine, but it is the Spirit of God that I believe wants to speak this glorious truth over us today that you and I are to be about the Father's business. But as we go, we're to make sure our motive, our heart condition, the desire of our heart, what motivates us to serve him, that that is alignment with his perfect will. So again, I want to show you what I call the sacred practice of giving. Look with me again back in uh, verse uh, uh, 2, chapter 6. When you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet. That's what the hypocrites do. Now, most of you are familiar with that word hypocrite. In the Greek language, it referred first to an orator and then to an actor who used giant masks to portray a character in a play. And that word came to mean not just an actor, but it came to mean, for obvious reasons, of anyone who pretended to be what they're not. And Jesus said the Pharisees and those who practice their righteousness, their works of righteousness, their self-righteousness, to be seen of men, well, they're hypocrites. They're hypocrites. They're doing it all for show. Don't be like one of them. A ravenous hunger for the praise of men was the besetting sins of the Pharisees. And Jesus is warning them, and by extension, warning us not to give as they do. And he says, don't go and sound a trumpet before you give as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the street. Because they want to be honored by men, and I tell you, they have their reward. Now, we don't know if it actually happened that some pompous Pharisees actually had them a marching band that went before them, trumpeting out to gather everyone's attention before they gave, or if this was simply a word picture the Lord Jesus is painting, and it really doesn't matter. What he's saying to us is if you're going to be like the Pharisees, you're in their camp as a hypocrite. Don't do it. They give... That's the right action, but with the wrong motive because they give to be seen of man. And they cause such a spectacle, it draws attention. Now, perhaps you don't know this, but back in the synagogue and in the temple, the boxes in which they gave their offering were made of wood. You're going to have to forgive me. Like everybody else who lives in Memphis, All this stuff that's blooming out, well, I'm allergic to all of it. It's just a good thing it's pretty, you know what I'm saying? Uh, But anyways, excuse me while I clear my throat. throat) Anyways, uh, uh, back back to my story, uh, there were wooden boxes and they had hammered brass, sort of an inverted trumpet shape. 
Now, they did not have paper money. So when offerings were made, if it was a large offering and if it was done with great precision, you could make quite a bit of noise. And there were those who made sure that when they put their coins in, they did it in such a way that it created quite a racket and drew everyone's attention. You remember the widow with the two mites. And Jesus saw her. She gave coins that were so small in that culture, they wouldn't have made a sound. And yet Jesus said, well, she gave more than everybody here all together she gave more because she gave everything that she had. And so he's talking about heart attitude. Are you doing what you do to be seen of men? Will you get your reward right then? That's not what a Christian is called to do. We're called to do our giving, but to do it from the secret place. Look in verse 3. When you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, that is considered, or at least from the research that I did, to be a well-known proverbial expression, meaning to do something spontaneously with no special effort or show. That's what it meant to them in that culture. The right hand was considered to be the primary hand of action. God bless you left-handed people. But the right hand was considered to be the strong hand of power and activity so much so that some jobs were so spontaneous and, and there was so much muscle memory that the right hand did not involve the left hand to accomplish the task. And that's what he's saying. When you give, it should be so spontaneous at the response of the Spirit of God when he pricks your heart and say, give this or do this or help that person or here's your assignment. It is supposed to be a natural overflow out of our private devotional love for the Lord Jesus Christ that but we do it without thinking. That's what he's talking about there. And so he says, when you give, there's a sacred practice of giving. You're to do it in such a way that it is done from the secret place. And your father, who is in heaven, he sees what is done in secret and he will Reward you. As Dana said, beloved, we are called to live for the audience of one. And when you and I begin to narrow our focus as a believer to the praise and the honor and the glory of Jesus Christ, it will affect every area of our life. Well, the next thing I want you to see is what I call the secret place of prayer. Look in verse 5, when you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so they may be seen by men. There's our phrase again, truly I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into the inner room. Close the door. Pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret he will reward you. Oh, and by the way, when you're praying, don't use mean, meaningless repetition. The Gentiles do that. The heathen do that. They suppose they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like that. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. Beloved, that is a prayer promise we all need to take to the bank in cash. Our father knows. He's a good, good father. He gives good gifts. James said every good and perfect gift comes down from the father above. He's a good father. And he knows where we are. He knows our name. He knows our circumstance. He knows our situation. And he is actively engaged in what affects every one of us. Oh, when you pray, go in the inner room. Now, this is a fascinating word. In the Greek word that was used here, it was used of an inner storeroom where treasures and valuables were kept. And he says, go into that place where all the treasure is. Go to that place. Go to the inner room and close the door. Beloved, when you and I go to the Father in prayer, I'm telling you, when we go into his presence, we are standing in the midst of all the treasure of Jesus Christ. 
We stand there in all of the riches of Christ. Beloved, we aren't just barely saved. We are redeemed from the marketplace of sin. We are brand new creations in Jesus Christ. Paul said we've been accepted in the beloved. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. We have been chosen in him before the foundation of the world. We've been adopted as adult children. A baby cannot use an inheritance. Only an adult child can. What Paul is saying is in that moment when that transaction took place, when you stepped out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light, guess what? Everything changed. Everything changed. And your standing in Christ is now that as an adult firstborn son. Double portion. And it's all yours to enjoy. Not in heaven when we die, although that will be glorious. But right here, right now, in this present kingdom, authority, and power and riches. Paul goes on to say, you've been redeemed and you have been forgiven. I don't know where you are or who you are, but I got to tell you, I had enough sin in my life prior to my conversion that there was a time that I wrestled with the assurance of my salvation because I could not imagine how a holy God was willing to deal with what I knew that I knew was in my past And I came to that place to realize that all of that sin was covered under the blood. All the sin of the past, all the sin of the present, and all the sin of the here and now. When I finally got that settled, I began to be stunned that he could still love me when I knew what was in my own heart and what kept showing up day by day. Even as a believer, oh, the flesh is powerful And y'all, it is subtle and it is sneaky. About the time you think you have that thing in order, dead on the altar, it'll sneak up on you and you will be, you you just can't believe you just said that. (laughs) You cannot believe you had that thought. You cannot believe that was your reaction. That's how subtle the flesh is. And the scripture tells us that in Christ we're new creations. And we are under the blood. We're in the secret place. The place of all the treasures of heaven. They are ours. Peter tells us everything pertaining to life and godliness is ours in Jesus Christ. He's not talking about heaven when we die. Although honestly, as we are watching this world go nuts, I think we're all eagerly anticipating. Boy, we want the sound of the trumpet even so come Lord Jesus. Oh, to be swept up and caught up into his presence, that will be glorious. But I've just got to remind us. That right here, right now, the kingdom of God is right here. We've been put in it and given exceedingly, abundantly, great authority and power and blessings upon blessings upon blessings are ours in Christ. He says, go in the secret place, go in the inner room, close your door, and there you are to pray. Your Father who is in secret, well, he'll see He'll see. He'll see what's done in secret. And he will reward you. In that day, it wasn't unusual for pious Jews to stand when they prayed. In fact, that was the common practice. They often stood and held their hands up and lifted their faces up to heaven. Pious Jews also prayed three times a day at 9 o'clock, at noon, and at 3 o'clock. And there was nothing wrong with that either. All of this was designed. To remind God's people to stay in steady communion with him. To worship him and praise him throughout the day. Nothing wrong with any of that. The problem was the Pharisees and the hypocrites who were like them had turned this into ritual. Ritual prayers. And they did it again to be seen of man. 
There's not anything wrong with you and I praying in public. We just did. Jesus prayed in public. We pray in public before services and at church and in life group. We pray in public lots of places. I often run into someone in the store and the Lord will prompt me to pray for them. And sometimes right there in the aisle of Walmart, just have us a little prayer meeting. There's not anything wrong with praying in public. The problem is, are you doing it to bring honor and glory to your Father? Or are you doing it as a hypocrite? to be seen of men. They actually lengthen their prayers with great repetition so they'd have even more opportunity for people to see them and to consider them very, very spiritual for what they were doing. The shortest prayer that's ever been prayed over me is one of my favorites. Um, uh, most of you know that uh, either Donna or myself are always standing right back here in the wings as, lo- as well as the uh, staff from Women's Ministry and Dana's back there with us. And we're praying up to the minute just about we step out here on the uh, platform. We pray with our praise team, pray over the room, pray over the chairs. All of that is done, beloved, because we're doing everything we can, seizing every opportunity that when you come, you know you've been invited to come and dine, come to the table. You are welcome in this place. And so everything is orchestrated in that way that we might see you move closer and closer to Jesus Christ. That's what this is all about. That's what we do. It's not just so you have some place to go on Tuesday morning. It's so that you and I can meet together and encourage one another and urge each other on in the faith. That's what this ministry is about. But I want to tell you one of the favorite things that has happened to me is when the praise team is singing and leading us in praise and worship. It's to be standing right back there. I got to tell you, the volume, it's probably not even healthy. I get up so close. I mean, it is loud and I am so swept into the presence of the Lord every time that they have actually worked out a code for me to nod at me when it's my time to come out because I'm simply lost in the presence of the Lord. Well, several semesters ago, Bethany Gaines, our pastor, and Donna's um, daughter, Bethany Um, she's Golding now, Bethany Gaines Golding, was going to do a special number. Some of you were probably here. It was Ain't No Grave. And I want to tell you, I I thought we were all going to go home. I thought we were just going to be raptured in the moment. But one of the real sweet things that happened is we were all back here and we're just worshiping, our hands are lifted, we are just caught up in it, is our pastor, Brother Steve. Now, if you're not a member of Bellevue, Steve Gaines is our pastor, Donna is his wife. And uh, Brother Steve wanted to come and worship with us, because, especially because Bethany, his youngest daughter, was singing. And it was so precious to watch it. He was videoing with one hand and had the other hand raised to the Lord, true father fashion, worshiping at the same time. And his head was thrown back and he was singing at the top of his lungs. I've got to tell you, it was just it was a holy moment that I was privileged to see. And so I began to sort of back my way out because I didn't want to intrude on that. I, I, I knew he was worshiping and I wanted to have my own worship time, but I didn't want to do anything that would cause anyone to be distracted. And so I had stepped on back there with some of the other ladies. Well, when the music was over, and I'm telling you, when Steve turned around, his face was glowing. It really was. He had been in the presence of the Lord. He really had. It wasn't just because. Bethany was singing but that certainly added to uh, his great delight but he turned around and he saw me and he knew I was about to bring the message and this is what he did he walked over to me and he put his hand on my shoulder and this is what he prayed Lord fill her up and turn her loose (laughs) amen and with that he walked out the door and I've got to tell you I have just got to tell I was suddenly up on my toes It was like, oh, oh, yes, uh uh-huh, everybody needs to step back because here I go. The shortest prayer ever prayed over me, and I've got to tell you, it's been one of my favorite. I still pray that over myself. Lord, fill me up. Turn me loose. Let me go in the power of the Spirit of the living God. Let what I have done in private, in study, in prayer now flow out. 
by the power of the Holy Spirit, not in my strength, not in my power. I could not bring you anything. You understand that, right? But all you turn him loose. And he begins to move. Beloved, we are praying for revival to break out, and there's no reason to believe it can't happen on a Tuesday morning when several hundred women have gathered to seek his face. I'm telling you, we're living in such expectancy. I hope you are too. I hope you are too. And what Jesus is teaching us, we are to live in this present kingdom, understanding that you and I are privileged as his children to give and to pray and to fast and to serve. But our motive is not to garner the praise of men. Or to be seen of men, even when it's a public expression. But to do it for the audience of one. I tell you, there is reward in heaven being laid up when we serve him. But I want to tell you, the sweetest reward, in my opinion, is knowing I've walked in obedience to his prompting and that he is pleased. Oh, there's eternal reward, but there is daily reward when we are there in the treasure trove of heaven and God is meeting with us in the secret place. In the secret place. Jesus is calling us, beloved, to a faith-based relationship. Beware of replacing a relationship with Jesus that is to be faith-based with a religion that is works-based. No amount of good works could ever gain favor with God. It is by faith through grace. Excuse me. It is through grace by faith in Jesus Christ. But having come to him, now he's calling us, and now I'm off my notes. And I know it makes some of y'all awfully nervous. (laughs) If Mr. Stockdale was here, it'd make him really nervous. (laughs) Because sometimes this is when the wheels come right off my bus. But I'm just going to go for it and show you what God has given me. God is calling us to a crucified life. We are to be dead to sin and alive to Christ. Therefore, Paul said, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service, is what New American says, reasonable service. I like that better. That's King James. It's your reasonable service of worship. After what Christ has done for you, it's only reasonable. That you would offer yourself a living sacrifice. Now the phrase living sacrifice, beloved, it's an oxymoron. A sacrifice by its very nature is death. But he says you are to crucify the flesh and to live unto me as a living sacrifice. You know what the problem is with living sacrifices? We keep crawling off the altar. The thing that binds us so that what we offer is consumed by the power and fire of God is discipline on one hand and devotion on the other. That's what's required to live the Christian life. And when we do it, we offer to the audience of one the sacrifice of self. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in this flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself up for me. If we would simply remember Calvary, what it costs, what it costs for him to purchase us. One of my very favorite books I read a few years ago, and I have this in your notes. It's by Jennifer Kennedy Dean, and the name of it is Altered. A-L-T-A-R apostrophe D. And because of time, I'm not going to read to you everything I included in your notes. I'm simply going to summarize it. But in the book, and I highly encourage you to read it, 
she determines, she invites us to turn the noun alter, the noun alter, into a verb. Alter our fears, alter our future, alter our possessiveness, alter our need to control. Live in an altered state, she says, and cooperate with the God who is committed to seeing you free of the toxic flesh that works against your freedom. Let the altar do its work in you, transforming fear to faith and worry to worship. Every time that old pattern starts asserting itself in your thoughts, overlay it with this new reality. I am altered. I am altered. I'm a living sacrifice. And on the altar, flesh is surrendered to crucifixion. Crucifixion is the prelude to resurrection. Altered living frees us to live in the power of his resurrection. That is what Jesus is teaching. It's not simply about good works. It's about a heart change that produces a transformed life. It's about a pure motive not to be seen of men, but to delight the audience of one. On the altar, the flesh is surrendered to crucifixion. And beloved, that is what moves us into the secret place. He uses the word secret in this chapter four or five times. The secret place. And I began to meditate on how to live in the secret place. Now, I'm just going to throw out a couple of things for you to consider. In Exodus 33, verse 23, Moses said, God, show me your glory. And God said, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I'll cover you there with my hand. Beloved, that's a secret place. An Old Testament picture of the solid rock of Jesus Christ, the cleft is the secret place. What Jesus is saying, you are to live and move and have your being in me and you will find me in the secret place. It is the secret place of his presence, beloved. Now, I want you to turn to Psalm 27. I know this is breaking the rules. We don't usually have you flip around through Scripture. But Psalm, I'm in Proverbs, Psalm 27 is one of my absolute favorite psalms. I spent six months in this psalm. I read it every day in my quiet time. I would just read it before the Lord and just sit until he spoke. I love Psalm 27. But look with me, if you will, in verse 5. Now this is David writing. In the day of trouble he will conceal me in his tabernacle in the secret place of his tent he will hide me. Do you see it? The secret place is in his tent. Now when David wrote this, King Saul was trying to kill him. And David is not talking about going into the secret place of the tabernacle, the physical place. He's in En Gedi, living in caves, trying to avoid being killed. What he's talking about is the secret place of his presence. Do you see it? That's what Jesus is talking about. When you give, when you pray, when you fast, do it from the secret place of my presence. And you will have altered your flesh and your motive will be to glorify the Father. Oh, that's not the last one. Flip now, if you will, to Psalm 91, another absolute favor of mine. I I read this, pray this, love Psalm 91. Look in verse 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. If you have a King James Bible, it says he dwells in the secret place of the Most High and abides under the shadow of the Almighty. Don't you love it? When you and I are living crucified, when we are living to the approval and praise of the audience of one, we are sequestered in the cleft of the rock. We are hidden in the secret place of his tabernacle. We are in the shelter of the Most High, the secret place of the Most High, and under the shadow of the Almighty. We won't turn to it, but in John chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus said, 
You're held in the hollow of my Father's hand. That's the secret place. Colossians 3, 2 and 3, we won't take time to turn to it, but it says set your mind on the things above and not on the things of the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You are hidden in the secret place, beloved. This is what Jesus is talking about. The secret place is Christ himself. The secret place is operating and living in his presence, in his direction, under his power, under his protection. That is the secret place. And when you and I learn, instead of trying to figure life out, instead of trying to come up with our own plan, instead of... um, trying to manipulate the people in our lives, trying to get control, trying to do things our way. When you and I begin to stop that foolishness and learn to run to the secret place of his presence, I'm telling you, he will meet with us there in the secret place. It's full of his treasure. It's full of his presence. It's there that he will prompt us to give, to serve, to love. It is there in the secret place that we will pray and we will meet our precious Father, beloved. That is the radical, disruptive message of the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, will you join me in the secret place? Let's pray. Oh, Father. For this glorious truth that you bring us into the secret place. That you invite us to come, I mean face to face. You invite us to come into your throne room and to speak to you like a father does a child. You invite us to come and dine at your table. You have promised that you will set a table before us in the presence of our enemy. And there we will commune with you in the secret place. Oh, in the place where the Shekinah glory of God dwells. Teach us, Lord, to operate. Not to be seen of men, but for the audience of one. Teach us that we will find you in that place. And in the secret place of your presence, we will meet with you face to face. Oh, Father, I pray for every one of my precious sisters, every one of these beloved women who are here in this room and watching throughout the church, those who are watching online. God, I'm just asking that in the way that only you can do, that the Spirit of God will just move through this place. That you will speak deep, will call to deep. That we will hear your voice saying, this is the way. Walk in it. That we will learn to go in the inner room to the secret place. That we will learn how to operate an in an altered lifestyle for your honor and for your glory. That we'll quit trying to live for approval or praise. That you will banish perfectionism and hypocrisy from our lives and that you will set us free from the inside out to operate to your honor and to your glory. Lord, we desire to live altered. We desire to live to the honor and glory and praise for the audience of one. In this quiet moment, our hearts are so turned towards you, Lord Jesus. We're just asking to breathe your life afresh and new. Breathe your spirit upon your precious daughters draw them up really close. Let them hear how much you love them. Let them rest in the secret place of your presence. Seal this message to us 
as we join our hearts in praise and worship. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. been washed with the word of God. And ladies, doesn't it just feel awesome to have his word wash our hearts clean? You know, as we talked about today, our hearts are desperately wicked. But God loves us right where we are. And you know what? He never, ever gives up on us. Our kingdom exercise this week is to practice the spiritual discipline of giving. And I hope you've already made plans in your mind on how you're going to do that. You know, giving is the opportunity to bless the weary world around us. And if ever we have lived in a world that's weary, that time is now. And while blessing, and while our giving actually blesses others, the greater work that happens is that our giving transforms us 
into the embodiment of Jesus Christ. We become Him to the world. And when that happens, the Father is pleased. You know, Jean mentioned Jennifer Kennedy Dean as she was teaching this morning. I had the opportunity to meet her a couple of years ago at the Southern Baptist Convention. I met her on a Monday, and on Thursday, she stepped into the presence of Jesus. You know, we have no guarantees that we're even going to be able to be back together next week. But what we do have is this moment, this present kingdom, when we can, in obedience, do exactly what God would have us to do and be transformed into the likeness of his son to live to the glory of God for the audience of one. Father, seal your word in our hearts. As we go out of here, Lord, let us not get distracted by other things, but to keep our minds stayed on you, focused on your son, following after him. Until we see you face to face. In your name we pray. Amen. I love you, ladies.